We're not. Can you hear me? My mic's on. Okay. Um, are you really All right. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, AIM and everybody who's helped put this on. Uh, they did another terrific job. We give them a round of applause. And I'm excited that it's here in, in Kearney, um, which um, some of you know is the tech capital of rural Nebraska um, for a while, uh, maybe much longer than that. Um, it is my hometown too. Those of you who are still here um, to listen to me, I assume you're either lost or you are, um, you are unaware of my reputation for giving these presentations. <laughs> I only started with uh, warning you that um, I usually come uh, lagging in, in, in preparation and it'll either be the best thing you ever hear or a total train wreck. But last year, or maybe it was two years ago, one of, one of the broadband uh, conferences where I was a panelist was kind of my breakout in the speaking career. And that's when I learned that I first started uh, getting groupies. Follow me to, to some of my presentations. Are there any of my groupies here today? There's one. There's a couple. <laughs> um, and it's not so much for the content that I deliver. I'm asked to speak on, on just about every topic, but it is for the uh, unorthodox presentations, and uh, you know that often might end up on YouTube for reasons that I don't want them to be on there. Um, so one of the things with conferences that uh, I go to. And again, I get, I get asked to speak um, quite a bit. Last week I was speaking here again, and it, it was on public relations. And uh, this time it's like, it's, it goes the, the full gong. I'm, I'm kind of making the party speaking circuit, and it's I'm kind of that guy if you need a speaker at the last minute. They know I'll show up, you know, 10 minutes notice or, or whatever. But, um, one of the things when I go to conferences, I, I get frustrated sometimes because uh, as, as a, a business owner, and how many how many from business and private industry are still here? I didn't know if there'd be any, okay, so we still have some. I didn't know if the students would be here or not, and, and a lot of my topic is geared towards them and the general population, but I think they'll get a good thing out of it too, is my clients will come back to conferences, and this has been happening for 10, 15 years, and they'll be all panicky. Um, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, they'll come back to the conferences and they'll, they'll say, Travis, I need to be blogging um, pretty much all day, I think, and I need to be doing uh, this, I need to spend a lot of time on that. And, and then, um, starting five, four years ago, or whatever, even up to last year, and, and now it's become more commonplace, it was this term social networking that was just driving me nuts. If I had to hear one more time, I was just going to scream. And so I would have my clients say, Travis, I need to be Twittering like all day long. I need to be doing stuff at least six times a day. And I'll say, you know, calm down. You're a heart surgeon. Um, <laughs> tweeting out most of the day is probably not productive. It would probably scare a lot of people to focus on, on what you do best. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we haven't changed all that much, the technology has changed, but how we don't need to panic um, either. So let me get started. And about me, upper left corner, of course, from around here, uh, Carney grew up in, in Columbus. Um, the, uh, let me try this out. All right, right there at the Carney Hour. I hope to speak a little bit about that today, but an embarrassing thing out of my company is called Iowa State. And, when that came out, it uh, apparently broke our, our app that uh, we've been pushing really hard for Iowa State, and since it broke a lot of other apps too, uh, the approval time from Apple, it is not approved yet. And so if you have Iowa State, it won't work, but what I can ask you to do is to download it anyway, and I have a little buzzer in here, and each time I get a five-star review, it buzzes me, and I'll make the presentation better as you go on. Also, <laughs> Our Facebook uh, page, and I want to try to get that over 3,000 uh, likes today. So you can like that, it will also buzz me, and that will make the presentation quicker and more engaging. Um, this is our location um, Stone School, the former Stone School in 2012. We bought it from Kearney Public Schools. Uh, so we're in a school building. Um, as soon as we graduate, we, we go back. Um, 
It is a 7,000 square foot building, which isn't big as the school goes, but it's, it's big for about 10 or 12 people. And um, it's, it's pretty nice. You know, it's 35 years old, so it's a block of steel. It's a good building. And uh, the gym left alone, we remodeled to the classroom so far in about 10 offices. The old library is the game room where we have uh, you know, ping pong or hockey and all kinds of other stuff we don't use, but we tell our recruits we use them all the time. <laughs> uh, here, is us winning, uh, we have won some awards as mentioned. This is us winning the, the Walter Scott Award this year with uh, one of President Milligan's last days and, and Walter Scott is on my team. And, uh, I, I like to share that the advice Walter Scott gave me on that day, which um, is pretty good. He speaking to me as an investor and as a businessman. He said, we like it when you make mistakes. Um, it means you're doing something. You're, you're taking risks. So we like to see uh, people who have our money doing that. But Travis, don't get a PhD in making mistakes. And um, I think that's pretty good advice. As an entrepreneur, you gotta take risks, but it, they gotta be somewhat calculated risks. Uh, here is my wife and me um, and our two kids. Angela is, a, a, of course, she teaches at Information Network Telecommunications here at UNK. Um, and uh, of course, Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Obermeyer here laid great uh, groundwork for that program and growing it. Uh, in the last few years, she's really helped it become a, a premier type of, of program. I was hoping to have some students here and to kind of explain some of the, some of the differences, but I can say um, they are getting the attention of a lot of people in industry and throughout the, the U.S. It's, it's one of the few programs like it and of its caliber, and she does come from industry experience. Um, <clears throat> so those of you looking to recruit or if you have kids, and they like hands-on things. They like to know how to make the World Wide Web, the internet work, and uh, you know, computer networks and all that kind of stuff. This here in Carney and all of our tech programs, really at UNK, are, are tremendous and outstanding. I recruit almost exclusively from UNK because I know what kind of student I'm going to get. I'm, I know the professors. I know how they were taught. Uh, the thing I like about UNK is I like the fact that it is a, a teacher's college, and to me that means. Uh, the teachers are there, they want to be teaching you. They don't want to, um, they do do research, they do very good research, but it's not this, uh, this teaching thing isn't something they're looking for a grad assistant because it's just a nuisance. And so they're very engaged with me as a business uh, partner in making sure the students are good. So 90% of our staff is uh, from UNK, very qualified. Uh, the one who's from Kansas State, we don't let her come out in public. <laughs> Serlene is six. He is um, insanely advanced with uh, how well he reads. I've started hiding all the books in, uh, in the house. He, um, he, uh, the other day I said, uh, Mom, so it's really fun to take a fish in. And he said, well, and he caught this grass off, got the scrap, yada, yada, yada. She goes, I know. I said, I, didn't know. I was like, he texted me all this. And that kind of blew my mind a little bit that a six-year-old could do that, communicate with grandma, but it, it, it's an example of how technology can be used for good and not necessarily evil. Um, and there's my daughter, Ayla, she's three, and she's a non-stop stand-up Okay, apparently late at night, I thought this would be a good slide to put in there. This is me over here. This, this, this is not showing up. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, what I was going to show you on the right, and I did this in Office Libre, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, the picture did not convert so much to PowerPoint. But over here we have a logo that's exactly like this from another Travis Holman in Texas. I've had mine since 08, he had his since oh, probably eight months ago, so I just didn't want you to get confused as, as to the difference. And I found that late last night. Okay, why should you listen to me? Uh, I think I can talk about my credentials, but testimonials be best, right? So last week uh, I was here giving a presentation. Uh, here's some of the testimonials I got. I already have received three compliments for a good presentation. You had it at our annual conference, breath of fresh air to make them laugh a little after two long days. So that's nice, right? Um, I thought, you know, I'm on the second day, I'm on clean up duty, I might be a breath of fresh air here too. I was mildly entertained by your mediocre presentation. I kept one eye open half the time. That is perfectly acceptable to me. I'm a glass half open guy before a diamond half open guy. I was excited that one person 
um, could keep one eye open for half the time. <laughs> you don't really expect them to pay you to sit through your presentation, do you? This is my mom after learning um, that I'm going to be giving another presentation. Um, you know, as testimonials, though, you can't have too many. It, you know, and they don't have to be all that good quality, really. <laughs> Sir, I hate you. I will never be able to get this wasted time back. That was this man down here right before I went up. He was also on uh, my presentation last week. Okay, so as far as the topic go, I don't want to come out saying that nothing has changed in the last hundred years. A lot has changed, but I'm, my uh, position is mostly in, in technology that has changed, and we have not. So what's changed in the last hundred years is hundred years ago we spent half our money on food and clothing, um, which if you think about it is, is a really big deal. Uh, two people can now farm 600 acres. Three, that's that I, I asked a kid who farmed how many people does it take to farm 600 acres, and he said two. So you might say three or four, but the point is, is it doesn't take a lot to farm a lot these days because of technology. Life expectancy has increased 26 years. Percent of people with degrees is 14 times higher. Federal income tax did not exist 100 years ago. Yay. And Dutch Boy Ping was as powerful of a company today as Walmart, Apple, or Google. Harvard had a national championship in FB. And what does FB mean to you guys? Yeah, they're on Facebook. If I have the students here, I might hear that. Well, Harvard's probably known more now for Facebook than they were in, uh, for then football. Okay, so since I didn't have a lot of time, uh, I do teach a class at UK called Society and Technology. And so I'm just borrowing a, a lot of stuff. But one of the things I like to do first few days is Rudy Volte has this curve that describes technological progress as it goes on and, and I like to do a few things with this with my students and then essentially what it's saying is uh, okay miles per gallon how that improves over time or the adoption rate or how many of you are on a uh, are on Facebook or social networking site can follow a trend that, that is similar to this and I tell the students to think about playing horseshoes for the first time when you first play horseshoes First toss you have, you might hit the, uh, uh, you know, you might hit the family dog. Um, you're all over the place. You're just terrible. But after a couple rounds, you start to get pretty good, and that's where we are. You know, this could be thought of as the early adopters, and then we start to get good really fast. But even with pro athletes or professional sprinters, you know, even shaving a, you know, a tenth or a hundred off is a huge deal. So you never really get. <laughs> There's this maximum rate of, of return that you can get, and that is up here. Well, I say this reflects a lot of stuff in life. Uh, if you think about it, you know, any kind of skill setting, you know, shooting free throws, it, it, it's easy to look at sports, but it's, it's a lot of things can be um, uh, reflected with this. Well, one of the things I like to ask, and, and, and Wolfie doesn't argue this, but I like to say, <coughs> Ask the students, okay, if this is time, the beginning of time, and this is the end of time, where are we at on this graph as a society as far as our progress? Um, and I let them digest that for a minute. But I ask, how many of you think we're, we're just here at the beginning? Okay, a couple of some of you are not going to answer anything. How many of you think we're kind of in the middle? Yeah, it's the easy route, right? You can't be too wrong. <laughs> How many of you think we're there? The rest of you aren't thinking at all. <laughs> You're the half, half. And then I always say, well, what is it, Mr. Holman? What's the answer? And how would I know? I don't know. I don't know where the world's going, and I don't know where we're at. But this is interesting to think about. Now, students will often think, yeah, last five years, I mean, we've had this go on, that go on, you know, the iPods and the iPod this, and, and all of this we're really really getting pretty far and you know somebody who was born in, in the 80s or 70s would be like yeah it's probably the last 30 years we've been really going far and the internet and all that kind of stuff well i want to kind of shake out the perspective a little bit on this three of these pictures these three pictures you all know they are okay for those of you who are too embarrassed to admit you know that's the space shuttle program that is the pyramid, probably a visa, I'm hoping, because that's what I'm going to go with. And that is Cleopatra up there. Which two of those are closer together on the timeline of history and advancement and all of that? Anyone want to take a guess? Okay? Yeah, yeah, the correct answer is not Cleopatra and the pyramid, but Cleopatra. <laughs> 
and the space shuttle program are closer on the historical timeline than Cleopatra and the pyramids. Uh, the, the pyramids at Giza, they were, I think they were, uh, they started on about 3500 BC, they were open for business about 40 years later, something like that. Cleopatra was 2050 BC about. The space shuttle program, of course, was you know, 80s, 90s all the way up to 2011. So you're saying, well, I mean, it's pretty close. There's only 500 years difference. Really, 500 years? I mean, think about it was going on 500 years ago. I mean, Christopher Columbus wasn't that far off from having you know, done his thing. Um, you know, the printing press wasn't that far off. That's a lot more towards this end than that end. So these pyramids have been around and we've been doing great things for a long time. By we, I mean just the world. Okay, it's awesome to assume that we've come so far in the last few years but when were the pyramids built, I already told you. How many countries possess nuclear arsenals? Anybody know? Okay, too many is what I'm hearing a lot, but nine essentially possess <laughs> nuclear arsenals. Now some probably want them, some don't want them, but the fact is, is that we started with that technology uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And not everybody can just go out and, and, and do this stuff. What percent of the ocean have we explored? Any guesses? Five, five percent. Uh, who's still scared to ride in a drive bus car for the first time? I am. Uh, I'm still scared to ride in an airplane of any kind. But my point for bringing that up is uh, whenever there's a new technology, it kind of scares us a little bit. And I liked uh, when the, the guy was talking about the drive bus car yesterday. It reminds me of a video that I showed at the class about. Uh, the first car salesman, they had troubles because the people driving them kept yelling, whoa, instead of hitting the brakes <laughs> to, try, to try to stop. And when did we first land on the moon? Again, that was 45 years ago, which I've already anchored your, your perspective in thousands of hundreds of years, but still, we haven't been doing all this stuff in the last five years. So this is my graph I made out of the rubies. Uh, this is how society changes over time, and what I argue is that it doesn't really. We don't really change that much. Just the technology and the conduits do. We cycle up, we cycle down. Stuff that was acceptable hundreds of years ago, um, then was unacceptable for hundreds of years, is now becoming acceptable again. And you really have to go dig in some history and you'll start to say, okay, maybe you're right a little bit on this. Okay, so what I did was on Tuesday I got a time machine and I went back to the time and I went to one of Cleopatra's minions and I got some DNA. I took a picture of it. Some of you are saying you can't do that, Travis. And if I have a time machine, I certainly can have an electron microscope. Um, off to the right, I came back in time and I took a picture of my own DNA. And you know what? Those things look pretty dang similar. And here's my point is that when we come out and we're born, we're the same that we were today, that we were thousands of years ago. Now, I'm always going to have one heckler who's going to come up afterwards and really try to argue with me on this. But the point is, we're pretty similar. Okay, so this is pretty bad. I thought this was pretty funny. And the only real picture I have of probably legal permission to use was my logo. Um, I did not know that you were gonna want to, to post this elsewhere. Um, but I will give permission. Let's give a few examples of common assumptions you might have about change. Okay. Well, the last time I gave the talk on this particular topic was on election day of 2012. And so that's, I left this part of it in there. And on that day, the, we were talking about how much we're divided. That was pretty popular as it is on all kinds of elections. And so my point at the time was we're no more divided now than we always have been. In fact, anyone know what this picture represents? There you go. We're, okay, you can only answer. Two questions total. <laughs> and you're done. <laughs> okay, so you have, uh, the, most of you know who Alexander Hamilton is, right? The guy who's on the $10 bill, those of you still use cash, but he's the first secretary of the treasury. And uh, Aaron Burr was a vice president. Burr, as sitting vice president, shot the former secretary of treasury, and that was totally cool. Okay. <laughs> It was like, well, let's pack up and go home sort of deal. Now, my point in all this is, you can look at examples and examples and examples going through, you know, Old Testament stories and all that, and if you line them up with the news today, 
they're going to be pretty similar in topic of all the things. In fact, yesterday I heard on the radio they did study somewhere in Berkeley or something about how many topics are sung about in songs. And how many of you think it is, you know? I think like, gosh, there's gonna be a million or a hundred or something. Well, they concluded it was just 12. Just 12 topics cover every song ever made, pretty much. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's an assumption. We're getting dumber, technology is breaking us. Yes, I know I misspelled better. Um, that was the whole point. Um, here is, and I see Dan in the back. And Dan gave a, at the uh, technology breakfast here uh, a year or two ago, uh, which he's a perennial app from Intellicom. Um, he gave a great speech on a topic that's kind of similar to this, and, and, and I liked it a lot. And I said, Dan, can I, can I use your, your quote? He said, well, it's not my quote. And I said, well, can I use who it's from? He's like, you better just go look it up on the internet and figure out where it's from. But how many of you have, have heard of this quote before? Essentially, the children now love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for olders, and love chatter in places of exercise. Anyone know who that's attributed to? Down on the left is Socrates, I believe. I think this is Plato, and that's probably Aristotle, or if not, it's really close. Any one of those guys? No guesses? Okay, well, none of them. Yeah, I found the source, but it still holds true. Okay, according to quotebestier.com, it was crafted by a student, Kenneth John Freeman, for his Cambridge dissertation published in 1907. Freeman did not claim that the passage under analysis was a direct quotation of anyone. Instead, he was presenting his own summary of complaints directed against youth, against young people in ancient times. Um, point is, it was still in 1907, and he was talking about ancient times, and we've had these same arguments, and they go on, and they go on, and they go on, and they go on, and they go on. And they never change. Okay, so the counter argument of this is there's some ways that technology might not make us so much smarter, but make us more informed. Um, and I just thought of a few examples. And here's an example my six year old is texting at a fifth grade level. Uh, encyclopedias and network TV are no longer an authoritative source for information. Knowledge and dissent can be communicated on a global scale within seconds. You think of Twitter. Uh, those with learning disabilities can often overcome them through advances in technology. Um, this list can go on and on and on and on. I'm sure you can you can add to it of how technology uh, is not making us dumber. Uh, and, and I think too about from both these books again from Luther and, and Gutenberg, uh, two things they had in common. So the pretty press was developed maybe 1400 something. It was in the 15th century. So thought Gutenberg is often given credit for it, and Luther came around. Maybe a couple few generations after some somewhere I'm talking about Martin Luther um, there, and this reminds me of my previous point about dissemination of information and technology. Um, and at that time, the church, which um, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation was going on, well, Gutenberg at that time there were a lot of the literacy was not what it is today, and. Gutenberg, of course, revolutionized this. And I often ask my students, do you think that the printing press or the World Wide Web is a, is a better invention for all time? And this leads to a lot of good discussions, and you really can't win this discussion either way. But the point is, is that this changed everything. This was like when the World Wide Web uh, came around. Because for the first time, you could be, you could actually read passages in the book and say, hey, here, you're telling me to do this thing that it doesn't say here. And that was Luther's big deal too. He thought if he could just get this information in the hands of the people and let them read it themselves, uh, you know, this this corruption would go away. Now the same stuff is still going on today. The same kind of churches, the same sort of stuff, the same arguments, same way to get it on. Uh, you know, we just use new technology. Okay, so part of the problem with how we look at now is being so great and so advanced and being at the top as in the past is because we often remember stuff like this. Not just Jan John Hancock, but we remember him as a signature. We remember this great writing style. We remember this, you know, these awesome words and we think, wow, that was when we were at the pinnacle of everythingness, right? And we fail to recognize that this great writing, this great stuff, these great people are still here today. 
Um, and, and sometimes I think we need to focus on that a little bit. And we failed to acknowledge that this existed generations ago too, which is, you know, it could have been, you know, one of their kids writing this, you know, but, but I don't know what this is. It looks more like Arabic than anything, but it is supposed to be English and there's probably profanity in it. But this is an example of bad handwriting. So we still have good stuff, bad stuff, just like we did in the past. As technology replaces the need for once necessary skills like handwriting, is a question I often ask. Should we be spending more time teaching our kids to write well in today's technology rather than spending countless hours learning the ancient craft of handwriting? Okay, I call it ancient. This might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's something to think about. It leads to some good conversations on, on the road home. Uh, being, my kid can spell pretty well, and when he doesn't, Siri helps him out, and he's texting grandma and telling her everything that we're fishing for. Um, I kind of embrace that a little bit. Does he need to be learning how to, um, you know, write? Let me let me start with this. Here's a short list of random skills. Apparently not hard. All of them are going to be on here because I did not did not look at the screen, but we'll go with what we got. Okay, these are once necessary skills. Okay, sword fighting, somebody's going to argue with me that the fencing association or something's probably going to be here. But I'm talking more about wielding big swords and stage of knights and, and, and whatnot. Not so much necessary for defense anymore. Horse husbandry, um, which is raiding um, horses. It's not any kind of social rights issue or marriage thing. Walking beans, how many, how many of you, I know we have the students here, walk beans. Okay, and I was gonna ask how many people under whatever age walk beans, and the hands tend to go down. Well, I walk beans, but I was one of the last people to walk beans. Well, there's been advances in, um, you know, pesticides and that sort of thing that makes it a little bit more obsolete. Blacksmith, do we have any blacksmiths in the, in the audience? Do we have any pirates? <laughs> <laughs> Card catalog. Okay, you guys probably know what card catalog is. I don't know if the students know what it is or not. Uh, asking for directions. I put that in there because those that was always unnecessary. Uh, and, 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 and I think that the men can agree that it was always unnecessary. And as we thought that way since the beginning of not time, it's still unnecessary. But now, with uh, you know all of our digital phones and navigation devices, it's it's complete. I mean, I think even the women can, can, can agree. We don't, we don't need to ask anymore. We just ask the device. Developing photos from film. I did that. I was the last, uh, it, you know, in the, in the dark room in yearbook staff. I was, I think, one of the last classes to do that. Uh, Fourteen and you can go home to Night Forge. No? Not, not, not needed as much, maybe? Okay. Uh, about the ability to memorize your site. Hundreds of pages from ancient manuscripts. You guys don't do that stuff every day, no? Again, Gutenberg came around, all of a sudden he was like, oh, thank you. I do not have to memorize this entire, you know, it, and literally people could, could do that with mnemonic devices, just hundreds and hundreds of, of pages, and it was quite accurate. Uh, Drinking with the guard um, I just put that in there, not so much because it's obsolete, uh, but because it's still a choice of mine. <laughs> And no new technology is going to give me the stuff drink from the garden hose. Okay, so going back to the handwriting thing. Woo! No, I wanted to go back. Down here, it, it gave me a little cue that said, how many of you know what an ampersand is? And you would raise your hand. Well, we'll try it anyway, but I cheated a little bit. Okay, do any of you have a piece of paper that you can write on, or at least visually do this on, on, the, on the table? What I want you to do is to draw, to write an ampersand. It's probably burned in your retina. So <laughs> okay, and I ask my students to do this all the time. Sticking raw about 10 minutes over here to draw one symbol. And he's cussing and starting over. Does anyone have an ampersand drawn? Here's what I usually get I usually get a curse of ass or a treble clap or just something, something ridiculous. And I think here's my point. If you were stranded on a desert island, you would probably need to write hella, right? You need to know how to do it. Now, 
you could probably do it. Like none of us write the, the courier, the times in the courier on A, right? We all can recognize it, but we don't necessarily have to write it. We're kind of slow on it. And so if we stop training that to, to our kids or to whoever or stop learning that, you could still probably do it, sort of, right? But how long an island would have like a backwards P and it would just look kind of silly and it would be, you know, and, and if you put help me and my wife, it might be help me, you know, trouble left. <laughs> Something that resembles wife uh, sort of thing. So maybe there is a need for it, I don't know, but here it is. It's a very simple symbol, but I never get anyone who really does it correctly. But you can all identify it if I identify it millions of times. And this gets us to my question, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if we simply need to know how to identify it or if we need to know how to do it. I just want to put this out there and get you guys thinking a little bit differently. Okay, so here's the other assumption. Instead of technology making us dumber, technology is making us smarter and better and can fix us, can change us. Again, I argue, no, not fundamentally as people, it cannot. Again, this is, notice that? You think that's my DNA, don't you? I actually flipped them this time. Cleopatra and my DNA are switched around. It's the same DNA and DNA. Um, the problem with thinking technology can fix every solution is that society's problems are not um, always, cannot be addressed by, by technology. And this is the thing that Bolte talks about a lot too. Um, these fixes, so for instance, methadone, it's, it's a halfway, it's a band-aid solution. So, so methadone can help somebody addicted to heroin by giving them a more acceptable problem, essentially. It doesn't cure them, it doesn't fix them, but it takes the best of what we got and it, it sort of treats them. Well, here's, here's what I'm arguing. There's always going to be good people, bad people, and again, you go back to the oldest books you can find, and they're always fighting about the same stuff, the same 12 things we, we do for uh, whatever we write songs about now, they wrote songs about in the Old Testament, and I'm sure, or however it works. This stuff doesn't change. There's always good people, there's always bad people. And a lot of us want to think that's never going to change. But here's, here's the nice thing about that. You, it, it, as often as people say, oh, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. It's not. It's just, again, it's just, it's just flat out, according to Mr. Holman. This is, this, is, this is my assertion. So you say, you're saying that technology changes, sort of, but we don't. And I'm saying yes. And I want to deliver a speech around this. It was on that same topic and it was from election day and I'm just going to read a really short, short part of it because I think it's uh, much better than me going off topic. We still fight, we're just using newer weapons, we still argue, we're just using te texting and typing more than talking, we still are building great pyramids but now that we've moved them to Vegas and build them out of steel and glass, the same things that drove us yesterday drive us today. Love and loss, greed and giving, fear and freedom. It doesn't hold to change, yes. But it's often cyclical and at the heart of all lasting changes technology. We as individuals do not really change. Our DNA has not changed, our bodies have not changed, our desires have not changed, our vices and pitfalls have not changed. And then I talk about in the 1960s, our country was bound and determined to put a man on the moon. We take it for granted today. But you have to remember that until the last century, nobody even knew for sure what Earth looked like from space. And that sometimes blows the kids' minds a little bit. Uh, nobody has seen it. To this day, there are still fewer than a couple dozen people or so who have seen the fully lit Earth from space. I'm talking fully lit Earth, so like the, the blue marble. There's only been like a, a couple dozen. You can fit them in a bus way. Um, that shows you like how little, you know, we've, 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 we've gone yet. If, if you're looking at, we don't know how far we're going to go. We were so determined to make it to the moon that in 1969, Paul allowed the astronauts strapped on their suits and rocketed in that outer space. Neil Armstrong said before his death this year, and this was in 2011 or so, that he wasn't real sure he was even going to return. President Nixon had already had a speech prepared should the astronauts find themselves so stranded on the moon. That would have been, I, I think, a big, big PR nightmare for everybody. It just a tragedy to do it. I mean, but we made it. Um, and we haven't done it again for um, you know 40 years, uh, 45 years, a long time ago. That was 69. I think the last Apollo mission was in early 70s, sometime around then. Somebody will know. Somebody will have me on it. 
This was 1969. Compact discs weren't invented. iPods weren't even close. Carburetors were still put in nearly every car rolling off the assembly line. Computers were laughable by today's standards. Today, nearly every man, woman, and child in this country is carrying a phone that is more capable than the best computers of that day. But you guys have all seen the NASA photos and videos of Command Central in Houston that day. What you see is a big room full of really smart people smoking cigarettes and using slide rules to help people, a couple guys get on the moon. If you fast forward to the technologically advanced space shuttle program that ran from 81 to 2011, the shuttle is considered the most advanced space transportation device ever. But even after major computer upgrade in 1991, the primary flight system, the general purpose computer, on the shuttle had a storage capacity of just one megabyte. And this is in 2011. And it is only zero, or was, 0.005% 0 as powerful as an Xbox 360. And an Xbox 360 is what fraction of a percent of whatever the newest thing is now. And we relied on them 20 years to get our people to space and back. What's this mean? And, and this is where I'm getting, bringing everything to a head with my, my main topic and what I want you guys to know. It means that reliability still trumps novelty. When it comes to technology, sometimes the best bet is tried and true rather than new and blue. Just because something is new doesn't mean it's better. Fundamentals are what matter. And again, this is more geared towards students, but I think we could all kind of learn from it. What you do matters more than what technology you use to do it. Technology sometimes fails, and more often than not, it comes obsolete. When this happens, it's your fundamentals that will make you succeed in, in these moments that you will truly shine. So much of what is invented, and so much of today's mobile apps, even the ones we build, uh, we draw on past theories, technologies, and just plain old boring math. Uh, so my company understands that people are driven by the same thing that drove them 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So we focus on that. We focus on what it is that really makes people tick. And then we build things that make that happen. Empathy is extremely important to success. Probably the most important thing, I would argue. Don't lose sight of the fundamentals that I went into building it. Math, science, hard work. Fundamentals is boring, the word. It's what allows you to set a goal, make a plan, accomplish something that's great, start your own company, be the next chief information officer at a university. Remember that technology is simply the latest conduit through which you can accomplish your goals. It is not a crush that will substitute for hard work. Technology is passive, but you are not. So the five tips I want you to remember and embrace and start using today because of this is tip one, you should focus on fundamentals. Um, after you do that, tip two, I want you to go ahead and focus on fundamentals. And then if that doesn't work, why don't you try focusing on fundamentals three more times? Uh, my point is, is that you will never be led astray by going back to some fundamentals. Why is it effective? Fundamentals are timeless. Fundamentals are able to adapt to sudden technological change. Fundamentals do not generally discriminate. They are a universal language. So if you become so application specific and learn how to use PowerPoint, this is the first time I've ever done PowerPoint, I did it on something else. Um, and, and you don't understand the fundamentals. But as soon as that becomes obsolete, just like Flash become obsolete in uh, our business for the most part, and you, your whole business was revolved around doing that application, well, you cannot adapt. But if you understand what it is that makes that tick and why it ticks, uh, you're going to be fine. Okay, really, can we just Google stuff and copy somebody else? If you have two fundamentals, sounds like a slow word is obsolete. And I was going to do this, but I think we're running out of time. And so I'll just describe what I do for my class. And it's all on a little side topic, but it's sort of related. And I ask everybody in the audience to say, how many people can build a paper airplane? I'll just ask you guys, how many know how to build a paper airplane? Okay, how many do not? Okay, there's, there's a few. And what I found over here, the past few years, every year, there's more people who don't know how to build paper airplanes. And I bet that, that used to be like a rite of passage, you know, that in your first grade, you had to know how to tie your shoes and build a paper airplane and throw it at the teacher. Apparently, that's frowned upon these days. But I will ask somebody who knows how to build a paper airplane to build a paper airplane, and there's only like four folds in it, right? It's super easy. Then I'll say, you know, give it to the guy who doesn't know how to build one, give him a new piece of paper and have him reverse engineer this. And this is when we're in the part of the book where it talks about, uh, you know, somebody getting a hold of our technology. You know, China got one of our Boeings or whatever, but they tried to create it and it wrecked. Or, you know, Osama bin Laden, when we went and shot him, the compound, we left a nice gift behind him. So remember that tail piece of that, of that chopper and everybody's panicking, oh my God, they have everything. 
They're just, you know, 10 days away from being a world power and destroying us because they have everything they need. And what happens is that the students can never reverse engineer that airplane, even with another one right in front of them, and it's only fourfold. It's like hideously ridiculous, and it just looks like a pile of garbage every time. And my point is, if you can't do that, how can you expect to do anything more complicated without really understanding it, without practicing it, like handwriting, without uh, learning it, without knowing more about it? You can't just expect at the last minute to kind of turn to some source, and that's going to bury you out. I mean, this is stuff you have to you have to do over and over again. You have to really understand at a fundamental level. You have to, you know, embrace it, whatever your trade or your craft is. Okay, so here we have, remember this guy? Was it like Twisted Sister or something like that? What was it? D. Snyder. Oh yeah, D. Snyder, okay. So D. Snyder, I googled 1980s something, <laughs> and I was going to say, uh, pictures of you know what was the newest thing in the 1980s and what was cool, right? And I couldn't help this this one I just had to put up, and that was probably never really that cool, but it was acceptable, right? And so since it was new and you know, synthesizers were being overused in the 80s and stuff because they were the newest technology, uh, you know it's going to make it better. But when we look back at a lot of that, a lot of us would still prefer a good Beatles song to uh, you know to some of that stuff back at 11. 10 to 11 driving over here, I heard on the radio on our local classic rock station, I heard Devil went down to Georgia. Now, it wasn't until 10 to 11 today that I knew that was classic rock <laughs> at, at all. But it's made its way through, whereas, you know, some other stuff is not. So, this used to be cool, okay, but that's always going to be cool, right? It will always be cool to wear a suit and to do certain things in certain ways because these embrace some kind of archetypes that are deep within us, right? There's art that's always going to be art that looks good uh, for some reason or not. So it doesn't always have to be new and, the, you know, the newest thing. Again, I argue that technology should be just a conduit and you should embrace it to do these fundamentals better. So find a way to take this technology and to do what it is that you did well and do it better, faster, more efficient. It's not going to change you fundamentally. So if you just remember one thing from this presentation, I'd like it to be this, and this came out of the blue from my last, from my presentation last week. I had a guy, and again it was on public relations, and, um, and, and I was talking about how you could use Facebook to address some kind of issue in a certain way, it's a very specific question, an answer and the guy says well aren't you worried about Facebook and security and somebody's going to do this and do that and kill you and all this kind of stuff and it kind of caught me off guard and the first thing I could think of was this and and uh, that is the best way to rob a bank is still in person and at gunpoint <laughs> and it just came out of my mouth but I thought there's there's a lot of good things as you go home, I think about 12 different concepts I just gave you that you've drawn from this. Um, you know, one of those being we're always going to have people who are going to rob banks and we're always going to have people who need to stop people from robbing banks. So there's always going to be that good versus this evil thing. There's just going to be that newer technology, right? Um, the guns are getting better. They're not. Uh, but again, some old technology, some old ways of doing things are really tried and true um, and always will be. Um, there's just a lot you can think about that, so just think about that as you go home and as you go to your bank next time and, and don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is funny. Give me 3% on CD for 18 months. Okay. That's it.